is your relationship with time? Are you wired and tired, stressed and overwhelmed, busy and going nowhere, or just want to scale your business? Welcome to Take Back Time with your host, Penny Zanker. Penny focuses on books, strategies, tools, and tips to help you work smarter and approach your time more strategically. As a result, you can have more energy, focus, and get more done in less time. Be more efficient and effective. Get ready to take back time. Hi, and welcome to Take Back Time. My name is Penny Zanker, and I'm your host. And uh, as you know, we are dedicated in here to help you to work smarter. And today, we're going to interview smart people, right, to help you to work smarter. So Jordan West is with us, and he is the CMO and founder of Little and Lively Clothing. He's also CEO of Mindful Marketing and a podcast host of The Secrets to Scaling Your E-Commerce Brand, which is now in the top 50 business marketing podcast in multiple countries, including Canada and the U.S. Jordan is going to share with us how he manages multiple companies and what he does to effectively manage his time, as well as some tips and tricks around um, his business expertise. Jordan, welcome to the show. Penny, thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, it's great. I love going and seeing how other podcast hosts host their podcasts. And, and this is awesome so far. So uh, <laughs> yeah, really appreciate you having me. And, and I realize your time is valuable. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Well, you know, everybody who's listening, they know their time is valuable. And that's why they're here is because they're going to get some brilliant tips and tricks from you on how do you do it? So tell us, how do you do it? You run two businesses, you're a <laughs> podcast host, uh, You've got a wife, right? Do you have any kids? Three. You got three kids, right? So <laughs> how do you how do you organize and manage yourself so that you can be be at your best and be efficient and effective? Totally. I mean, it wasn't always like this, right? Like I have made so many mistakes along the way. I'm 34 years old now, and I'll tell you, my 20s were not like that. My 20s were working all the time. I think I was kind of in, I think people go through these modes, right? I call it the Gary V mode, right? Where it's like <laughs> hustle. You just have to hustle and that's what you do to get there. And I think that's great for a time, but it's actually not sustainable at all. And it actually doesn't create a life that in my opinion is a life that I want to live. I, mean, I was so, there. I hear you. I, in my, It's funny that you say that. In my 20s, it was the same. I started my own technology business and I built it up and uh, it was all about the hustle, right? So what is yeah. it for your 30s? What would you say is... Uh, is the age of the 30s for you then? Well, I, I think for me, it's realizing that my time is my most valuable commodity that like, I just don't take phone calls anymore that I don't want to take. I've gone now, I'll kind of ch- tell you what the end game is, is that I actually only work nine till two every day. After that, I'm off. I don't respond um, to messages generally after that. And I take an hour lunch every day. And it took me a long time to get to that point. And for my team to understand that that's the way I was going to live my life as well. Was that a goal? Let me just ask you a second, because let's say there's people who are in the hustle. Was that something that you decided earlier on and you worked towards? Or was it like cold turkey? You just said, bam, this is what I'm doing. I'm only going to work from nine to two and go. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. It actually came from doing business coaching with somebody. So I was the the coachee and, uh, and we talked about my goals of my life because, you know, at this point have been very successfully, uh, very successful financially. And I'm like, well, I don't feel successful. I feel like I'm working more than ever. And right. what is it? What does it even matter if we're successful financially when you don't have any time to do anything? And I, you know, can't spend time with my kids. And so going through this coaching process was incredible. And now I'm like the biggest advocate for coaches. I just think that it's like invaluable the what you get from a coach. And so we no set doubt. this goal. Because they see your blind spots, right? And then they can get past all those excuses that you put up as to why you have to hustle. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. And so, you know, had this goal. And, and to be honest, I think it only started, it started like right before COVID, like in February, where I was realizing that I didn't want to continue on that sort of lifestyle where I was, you know, working eight till four and then, you know, at nighttime working on my computer and for what, right? It was like, it didn't make sense to me. And so we set this goal of taking lunch every day because I would work through lunch every single day. I would order, skip the dishes in every single day. I was at my office and it was just like, okay, another interview, another whatever, just trying to get as much, cram as much into my day as possible. And so we just started with just taking lunch. So I block lunch off every single day for an hour. And that was the turning point for me. It's like, 
Oh, how did you stick with it? I'm hearing it's a turning point, but I want to ask you, because there's a lot of people who would love to do that. And all the excuses are going through the head and they don't have the time and it's, uh, it's not possible and blah, blah, blah. So how did you hold yourself to that? Well, I mean, practically I just block out my calendar every day during that time. So if somebody's going to try and book something with me, when I give out a calendar link, they just can't during that time. So you block Uh, it out of your calendar. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's one really, really practical way that I do it. And then, and then after that is the self-control of saying no. Right. So I do occasionally, I will occasionally take a, an in-person business meeting during lunch. Right. So that's something I will do, but I really try to keep those to a minimum, maybe once a week doing something like that. And the rest of the time, it's like meeting my wife for lunch. She runs our clothing company. So I'm going to be meeting her for lunch right after this. And, and we may have to talk business a little bit, but at least I've got that time where I'm not on right during that lunch. So that was the first step of the process. The second step was making a priority at the beginning of the day of walking my kids to school. So uh, my two older kids, I was like, you know what? I really want them to walk to school instead of me just like being in a rush and dropping them off. So every single morning I walk them to school. It's about a 20 minute walk, uh, probably more like half an hour on the way there with them. <laughs> and, uh, and then I get coffee sit down and start my day at the coffee shop answering, you know, any sort of messages from our staff or emails or anything like that. So that starts my day at about nine o'clock. So that was the next step. And then the two o'clock, I just decided, I was like, you know what? After two o'clock, I don't really get anything done. I'm like in a fog. I'm not really effective anyway. Why don't I just stop my day then? (laughs) And so, I mean, as I'm sure that you've talked about on here, oh my gosh, what's the rule? What's the rule? I'm thinking of Pareto's principle. It's not that. twenty rule. Yeah. I talk about that a lot. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about the rule. Oh my gosh. I reference this all the time. Parkinson's law where oh, Parkinson's whatever time, yeah, whatever time you have to get something done, you will take up that amount of time. That's and right. so for me, essentially I have four hours throughout the day. And I always say to people, I'm like, I'm going to get eight hours of work done in these four hours. And so I do during that time. And so I'm really trying to actually treat my time as the most valuable commodity. And the only way I can do that is to actually surround my life with that. Right. Can I challenge you for a second here? Oh, sure, sure. Please, I don't please. think you I don't think you fit eight hours into four hours. And I think there's a myth here, and I just want to point it out. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, please. Because a lot of people think that they need to get more done in less time. So that's mm. the eight hours and four hours, right? Yes. I think that you work really effectively for four hours and you work smarter and you delegate things so things get done, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you yourself work eight hours in four hours, right? So because it's almost an oxymoron of, is that really possible if you're really working those four hours, right? Or whatever hours they are. So I want to challenge you and ask you whether that's true or are you just working smarter in the way that you work and more focused so that you are working a full four hours, right? Versus eight hours. That's a great challenge. And I think you've definitely nailed it right there is that what I've done this year is move to um, adding two extra virtual assistants. So they'll do a lot of the work for me. And so I have to set up the systems for them. But at that point, like the amount of, I think I've been on about 30 podcasts in the last month. And I haven't done any of the booking myself, right? Until I get onto the podcast. And I think that's where I'm really actually valuable, but doing the booking itself, there's not as much value that I can add in, in that sense. And so that's definitely one thing. I think right, you nailed so you're it, focusing right? focusing on the high value tasks that absolutely you have to do and want yes. to do. Yes, yes. And make sense for you to do. So you're delegating the things that can be done by other people. So you're the way that you're getting eight hours of work done in four hours is by bringing on a team to support you. Totally. And so it's probably actually more like 20 hours of work, right? Right. (laughs) In those four hours, right? Right. Of really knowing, okay, what do I need to delegate? How do I need to set my team up for success? Because there's a lot of different things, right? At the marketing agency, we need to be up on, you know, whatever the latest tactics are and strategies. And I can't be doing that with clients, right? So we have a big team that deals with all of that, but the direction comes from me. And so I need to be doing that. And it doesn't mean that the tasks that I'm doing are more valuable. It's just the things that I'm really good at. Right. We all need to know where our strengths and weaknesses are, right? And it's not necessarily worthwhile to spend a lot of time, money, and effort to focus on getting better in our weaknesses when we can just hire somebody or work with somebody who who can mitigate those. Totally, totally. Yeah. One of the things that we do in both of our companies is strength finders for both. So we can actually see what people's, you know, top five core sort of strengths are and try to play to those strengths. And since we've done that, I feel like we've become a lot more efficient and not only efficient, we just have more fun because we're doing the things that we like. And, you know, people have to do things that they don't want to do, right? We all have to do that. But we try to make, uh, you know, the environments that we work in ones that are conducive 
conducive to like a happy, healthy life. Absolutely. So I always ask everybody this question. So how do you define productivity and why? I think productivity to me is meeting a goal that you've set. And for me, that really does allow for others to help me be productive. That's a, I said I was good on my toes, but I mean, that's a tough question. (laughs) That's totally, it's a good answer. It's fine. Nobody's given the same answer in everybody that I ask. So, uh, you know, that's interesting, right? To understand that productivity means different things to different people. So also when you're working with your teams, right? It's important that whatever you're defining or a problem that you're solving is you need to clearly define it together so that you're all working from the same understanding of what it is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's great. So another question, uh, tip about, you know, what's your shortcut? Like if you had to say there's one thing that cuts through the chase and it's the 20% that helps you get 80% done. What's the, what's that one thing that you do that works awesomely for you? Uh, time blocking for sure. I block big chunks of my day to do certain things. So in those, you know, four hours that I have throughout the day, I make sure to protect those times. So if I need to, you know, think over a problem, I'm going to time block that, you know, half an hour of thinking. In the book, The Road Less Stupid, he talks all about this time blocking, about thinking time. And I've really taken that to heart. And I think that those are those little tiny, you know, hinges that move big doors. And so that's been really valuable to me. I'm a big proponent of that as well, because quite frankly, is that otherwise... Most people, they'll only have in their calendar what they need to do for other people, right? And then it becomes, right? So I have a meeting with somebody else because to work on this project or whatever, and there's nothing wrong with that uh, to put those meetings down, but it's it's not the things that are moving the needle for you. It's not the most important things. And we tend to be people pleasers. And so that's Mm -hmm. where then our schedules get filled up with what's important to everybody else. (laughs) Totally. And it's all about control, right? Like who has the control over your life? Do you right. have the control? Do you have this internal locus of control or is it like everyone's doing things to you? And and for me, and I think for most, you know, CEOs and founders, they have a very high internal locus of control. And for me, I do struggle with that of like, everyone's booking into my calendar. Well, I let them book into my calendar. Like right. it wasn't, it wasn't their fault. <laughs> right. Right. You allow that to happen. Now, I was going to go in a different direction, but we're entrepreneurs. We do have more control over our calendars than we take control of. There are situations for people who are working in corporations where they don't have as much control over their calendars. What would your feedback be to somebody who's in a corporate role who says, yeah, but I don't get to say I'm not going to attend that meeting or I don't get to turn that down. What would you say? I think that you can make a really good case, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, to whoever is in, you know, in charge of your time, that you can be much more effective and you can, I'm sure that you can use studies and you can use some sort of like persuasive techniques to your boss to let them know, hey, I don't need to be in that meeting, right? I'm going to be way more effective if you give me that hour back to be able to perform this task or to be able to think about this specific role, especially at the executive level, right? Uh, Less meetings, I really think are always better. I agree. I mean, I think that it has to start from top down also to reevaluate our whole meeting culture, right? Like you said, Parkinson's law, like what is the real time that our meetings need to be? Do they need to be 60 minutes? I mean, look at this whole scrum thing, right? They meet for 15 minutes and it worked. So we need to be, you know, we need to be rethinking why are we meeting? What are we meeting for? uh, And where can we have some alternative forms of communication as opposed to a meeting in some instances? Totally. So, all right. So let's switch gears a little bit. I want to ask if you had to delete all the apps off of your phone and your computer, what are the top two that you would add back? And they would be the first ones that you would add on because you use them the most. Uh, I'm going to just have to say LinkedIn. Okay. (laughs) I know that's terrible, but any of the social media apps, that's the one that I really rely on for connections with people, especially in business. If everything else went away and LinkedIn was still there, I could do anything business-wise with the the connections that I have on there. Well, it makes sense. You're a marketing company, right? So so LinkedIn is people are where a good part of that communication takes place. Yeah, totally. And and not only for that, but we're in acquisition mode right now with our clothing company. So we're reaching out to a lot of other baby brands looking to potentially acquire them. And that's just the anyone who's going to be at that level that we want is probably going to be on LinkedIn. So that would definitely be one of them. And then second would be podcasts. I could not do without the podcasts app, the the Apple podcasts app. Like I spend so much time listening to podcasts. I wish that I could combine that with Audible, you know, like, can I have both? Well, you could have more than two, right? I just wanted to know which ones, you know, are your 
uh, efficiency tools, right? So I, I don't know, is there another tool that you use that makes you and helps you be more efficient and effective? So you said time blocking is your shortcut. Do you have an app that you use that supports your time blocking effort? Google Calendar. Yeah, I mean, like, and that's exactly what I'll do throughout the day, right? Is put in, if I have a big task, which I've got a really big one for our agency right now, it's creating about 55 videos for our staff to be able to use that are like strategies that we're going to be using on basically every single e-commerce client. I have to create these videos and that is a massive task, right? 55 different strategies and different videos. So for me, I'm going to, for the next three days, put an hour every single day to doing these videos and block up my calendar. Nobody can book in during that time. And that's how I'm going to get it done. I just interviewed Nash Ahmed from Undoc. Interesting new tool that focuses our time management around the calendar. And it has Mm. some AI in it that actually will help you to move appointments around based on prioritization and things like that. So really interesting. So cool. uh, Undoc. Okay. I'm I'm going to take a look at that. and And it links in with your current calendar mechanism. I have just downloaded it, have not tried it yet, but based on what he was talking about, I'm going to be a huge fan uh, if it does everything that he says it does. So <laughs> awesome. it's a free tool. It's a free tool. So I'm not, oh, I'm not cool. plugging anybody's tool. I don't get anything from that. I just, uh, yeah. I love new technologies that help us to, to work smarter. So, you know, let's switch gears and just talk for a moment about marketing, right? So your genius is in and around marketing. So what are some top two tips or three tips that would help people in terms of working smarter around the way that they market themselves? It really depends where, you know, what sort of industry you're in. I'm really good in the business to consumer space. That's a space like I feel like I really know very, very well. You know, a couple tips there is if you're just starting out, spend as much as you can trying to figure out your customer, right? And getting as much data as you can. I think that that's one of the things that a lot of people don't do is they don't have a feedback loop of data. And so we're really trying, especially at at Mindful Marketing, our agency, we really try and get that feedback loop going in all sorts of ways. So we use, again, I don't get anything for this. We use an app called Prove It that does post-purchase surveys, which is hilarious because it's like so old school, right? To do a post-purchase survey. Man, are we ever finding out incredible data of where people think that they heard about us from, right? Yeah. Because you can, attribution is this huge black box that we don't exactly know how to attribute sales to certain channels, right? Google will tell you one thing. Facebook will tell you another. They're taking credit for the same purchase oftentimes, right? And no one's really good at it yet. Um, There's some tools out there that cost you know thousands of dollars that say that they're good at it. I still don't think that they're incredible at it because I want to know the actual purchaser intent. So I think that's my big tip for everyone is like, get Mm -hmm. that feedback loop back right? So that you can say like, Hey, yeah, Facebook is telling me that, you know, we had a hundred purchases on this certain ad. That's cool. That's great. Really great to know that that's really pushing the needle forward, but I want the feedback back from the customer. Absolutely. Right. Because the more you know about the customer, the more you can tailor the message, the more you can tailor the product, the more that you can do with that information. So yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Totally. Yeah. We're huge. It doesn't have to be rocket science, right? No. Maybe it's back to the basics types of things. You know, if you're going to go and reorganize a football team, apparently they go back to the basics, right? And they learn the blocking and the tackling and the, <laughs> right in the playbook. Yeah, 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 yeah. One of the, just on that same sort of note is getting customer feedback. I'm a huge fan and proponent of VIP groups for any sort of, whether you're business to business or B2C, it's all the same, right? You're talking to humans no matter what. And so VIP groups are a great way to get feedback from your customer. So for at our clothing company at Little and Lively, we have a VIP group that's about 8,000 people and we'll ask them a question. We just released our Christmas collection. And but right before we were about to release it, we asked them about which graphics they liked better, right? And we were just trying to stir up some conversation. Which graphics do you like better? Everyone said they didn't like either of them. We had like 300 comments that were like, yeah, we don't like either of them. Wow. So That's amazing. We, know, right? Really important. So we went back to the drawing board, came up with new graphics, showed them. They were so thankful that we had mm-hmm. asked them and then went back and actually changed things. And we sold out of the collection in about half an hour when, when we launched it. We knew that we had done right by the customer. And in, in the end, the revenue was just sort of the thermometer, right? That showed us that we'd done right by the customer. Right. I love that, right? Both of them are talk to our customers. Why is it you know, that we get in our mind that we already know what the customer wants? And it is so important to talk and to not make those assumptions and have those conversations and to get that feedback. Yes. And by the way, yes. you know what I think is important to note here, and I know that you would say is the same. I'm interested 
it's also important in your company and for your staff. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me how you do this within your staff, because if you're doing it for your customers, I'll bet you're doing it for your staff as well. Totally. So we use Slack as a communication tool and there's a great free plugin in Slack um, called Polls. If you just search Polls in the Slack workspace, it's awesome because you can do anonymous polls. And that has been the best, right? Is these anonymous polls within our staff to figure out what they want, especially during the time of COVID. I think there's just so many polarizing views that people have. And so to have an anonymous poll has been amazing. So at our clothing company, you know, we weren't mandated to wear masks inside. Some people wanted to, some people didn't. And so we just asked, like, what do you guys want to do? And the outspoken people said, no masks. No, I don't want to wear a mask inside. Yet 80% of people in the anonymous poll said, yes, I want to wear a mask. Mm. Awesome, right? Like a really good example of like, if you just listen to the loudest person in the room, you're probably not going to get the best feedback. I love that. That's true. That is so true. Yeah. So we've done that on the, on the marketing agents, oh, agency ahead. side as well. It's just, it's just a really great way to be able to do things and then people to actually be able to, to say their thoughts. That's great. Did you get any like overarching feedback about what people are having challenges with working from home? No, so far we haven't actually gotten much feedback on that. That's a great, that's maybe something I'm going to bring to the team. At our clothing company, we're still all working at our factory. So everyone's still working from there. But at the marketing agency side, everyone's working from home. And yeah, that's a really, really good question. I'm going to bring that up. Something to check in, right? Yeah, yeah. For all of you who are listening too, right? Check in with your people uh, about various different things. Understand what's the level of trust that people have in the organization, right? Because there are some, uh, like you said, if you make it anonymous, people are willing to share. And this is all really valuable information to find out where is your culture right now and what is it that you want to be creating and how do you better serve your your team internally? Totally. Because culture is, I think it's a lot more difficult to create being remote, right? It's- uh, Got to work at it. Either way, you've got to work at it. Because if you're not purposeful when you're working with your team to create a culture, then the culture will create itself. And mm. uh, and that can be very challenging when there become toxic elements or undesirable you know, elements in there that, that really aren't productive or aren't towards the purpose that the organization wants to go. Totally. We saw that actually very recently with the clothing company, and we made sure to nip that um, when that happened by creating internal core values. That clothing company overarching brand is called Kindred. So we created this document that's what Kindred people do. And it was really, really effective at pointing our culture back in that direction. And we we let people know like, hey, if you can't be a Kindred person like the rest of us, that's okay. But you may want to find somewhere else to work. And everyone got on board with that idea. Well, that's important, right, is what you did with that. And I just want to highlight because maybe people don't understand is you identified what were the behaviors that you want to see that meet those values. Because sometimes people just define the values. And I believe that that's not enough. It's not deep enough. Because like I said earlier, is that we have to all know that we're talking about the same definition. And when you can really get down to saying, hey, this is what people do who are purposeful. This is how they show up. This is how they behave. So, you know, that's really a great thing for people to do. We're thinking about how do I guide my culture and my principles in my organization is get down like you did to the behaviors and say, this is what We do. Totally. Totally. Awesome. I love it. So uh, we've talked a lot lot of great things about working smarter internally in our business for you personally and how to manage yourself as an entrepreneur and a little bit about the marketing side. Is there anything else that you wanted to share before before we close out the show? No, I, I think you'll agree with this. What I want people to know is that you have control right? You have the ultimate control, whether you know, you're working for somebody or you're working for yourself. You do have more, a lot more control over, over your life than you think. And right. Take it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to know it, right. And then you have to take control because uh, I was just talking to, you know, interesting point. Maybe we can have a deep moment around this and then, and then we'll close out the show. I was just talking to people about this whole concept of control and that, you know, there's the circle of influence. There's the thing in the center of what we can absolutely a hundred percent within our control. Then there's what outer circle that's sort of what's in our influence. And then there's the things that are out of our control. We spend so much time, money, and energy trying to control the things that are outside of our control Mm. that we're so exhausted and whatever, learned helplessness that we don't take control 
It's like a terrible paradox. Uh, We don't take control of the things that we absolutely can, like our distractions, like our time and so forth. So what's your thoughts or feedback on that? Yeah, totally. I have something actually interesting along that same line. I was a full-time paramedic for a lot of years. While I had businesses, I was still doing the full-time paramedic thing. And we went through a really bad, probably similar to in the US, and we went through a really bad opiate crisis Mm -hmm. where we'd just be going to overdose after overdose. And it was just really draining staff. And this was a few years ago now. And I had a psychologist come in and, and explain explain this principle to us. And so that principle, I really believe changed my life of thinking about the, what I have control over, that that's what I'm going to spend my time on, right? So do I have control over who wins the election? I have zero control over that. Only your vote. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. Just my vote. That's it. That's it. After that, I really have very little control over that. And yes, it's incredibly important. And so he talked about the four quadrants, right? There's the things that you have control over that are important. And then things that are unimportant, we mostly spend the time on the things we don't have control over and are important, right? Or even aren't important, right? Like, <laughs> right. And so I want to spend the time in those, in that quadrant of things that are really important that I have control over. And that has changed my life. I'm so glad you brought that up because I just think that that is like such a mind mindset shift. It totally is. Right. And when you realize like, oh my God, I'm wasting all of my time and money, my energy and everything in this area that uh, I'm only banging my head against the wall. Sometimes we forget. So we need to be reminded, Hey, is this in our control? Is this where we should really be focused or would we be better served shifting it into something that we absolutely can make a difference. Totally. Yeah. We get into these patterns too, right? These thinking patterns and it's kind of soothing, right? It's a bit of a crutch for us. Like, awesome. Okay. I can talk about politics and the side that I'm on and this is great, but it's really, instead of being a crutch for you, it actually becomes a bit of a leash that you're just like, you just go to every time instead of really working on the things that are actually important and and impactful. Right. It's a distraction. It's it's like, why do we procrastinate or, right? It's something that's easy uh, so that we can avoid the things that are a little harder. Awesome. Well, Jordan, you were awesome. It was great having you today. Where can people find out more about your clothing line, find out more about your marketing business and, and get in touch with you? Yeah. So uh, clothing is littleandlively.com. So if you have kids, that's what we really specialize in. And then on the marketing side, we're uh, mindfulmarketing.co. So if you search mindful marketing, you'll find us. And for me personally, I love connecting with people on LinkedIn. So if you just search Jordan West on LinkedIn or Jordan West Marketer, that's what my uh, URL on LinkedIn is. And I love to connect. I'll take, just so everyone knows, I take every single connection request on LinkedIn, whether you're going to spam me or not. All right. Well, there you have it. But please don't spam him. Spam Let's me. create a meaningful conversation. <laughs> together, right? Mindful marketing, be mindful in how you interact with one another. So thanks, Jordan, for being here. And thank you all for being here. You know, this was, there were a lot of good things in here. So you might want to go back and re-listen just to capture to rethink, maybe watch it this week and then, or listen in and then, and then recap it again in a week or two and see where you are and see what else you take away from it. Cause there's always more to take away. And we, we really packed a lot. So thanks again, Jordan. Thank you all for being here. My name is Penny Zanker and this is Take Back Time. We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening. Today's topic is another opportunity for you to put the knowledge you learned into practice. Tune in again next week for more strategies that will help you have more energy and focus to get more done in less time so you can continue to take back time.